Empower Than Power Women podcast for your career and your life, no matter what business you're in. Hello, hello. It's July, which means it's time for episode 25 of the Northern Power Women podcast. If you just keep going, you will get there. I'm Sam Walker, and this month we were very proud to be hosted by Durham University, a globally outstanding centre of teaching and research excellence, a collegiate community of extraordinary people, a unique and historic setting. Durham is a university like no other. Or as Professor Sue Black, incredible tech evangelist and professor in computer science at Durham University says. We find it easy to be proud of the extraordinary people we have at Durham. We offer the inspiration, they achieve the outstanding. We invite you to join them. Our discussion panel took place in the beautiful business school and we talked about how the North can respond to Brexit, why paternity leave is still eschewed by so many men and how to give a voice to underrepresented women in business. Partnership, that ability to collaborate with people, I think particularly in the space of supporting women is hugely important because it's very easy to feel a bit isolated. In the big interview, it is the hugely inspiring Professor Sue Black, who talks so honestly about her passion for tech and her incredible career after leaving an abusive marriage, living in a refuge and being a single mum of three children with just little education or prospects at the age of 25. She's amazing. I thought, well, I'll try and go back to work now, but actually I realised that there's no way I could really go back to work because I couldn't earn enough money to even pay for childcare. I'd left school with five O-levels and I probably would have been on minimum wage going back into the workplace. And with three small children, you know, there's just no way that however many hours I worked, I won't be able to pay for childcare for the three of them. And there's no Ask the Hive this month. It will be back, though. But for July, we're going to bring you a series of shout outs celebrating the often unsung heroes in the Northern Power Women fold. We appreciate you. But first, a huge happy birthday to the amazing, tireless and fabulous founder of Northern Power Women, the one and only Simone Roche, with some news from HQ. So where on earth did the month of June go? It's been totally crazy, going from east to west and then back again, up and down, on so many motorways I've lost count of, so many trains I can't even remember which way I went, and without a doubt getting off 15,000 steps in each day, and probably quite a few more when we went to see the Spice Girls at the Etihad, but that's probably just on account of my rather ridiculous dancing. A big, big thank you to the University of Durham Business School for sponsoring this month's episode. They hosted a fantastic panel discussion, including Professor Louise Bracken, John Waite from Advertise One, and author, speaker, and coach Dee Coxon, talking about everything, including Brexit, um, in a really lively discussion on what beautiful surroundings to work and study. And thank you so much for hosting us. And a big, big, big amount of gratitude to Professor Dr. Sue Black for being our Person with Purpose interview. You'll agree she's had an amazing journey and I hope you look forward to listening to her later in this edition. Thanks to Mawson, to sponsors of our Future List and Innovation this year for hosting the first ever gathering of the alumni of the Future List. We had a brilliant event over at the HQ in Eccles in their 50th year with guest speaker powerlister Yvonne Harrison from UA92 entertaining the audience with her career journey with some great little tales along the way. We've been up in Preston for at the County Hall for the second in our Northern Power Women Role Model Series, talking about funding for entrepreneurs. We had speakers from the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, Access to Finest and Nat- NatWest Bank, um, giving again a really lively interactive discussion, debate um, about how to unlock the, uh, the potential for funding. Again, another really interesting event that we had when we partnered with the BBC 5050 project over at Media City, bringing together 50 of our power and future listeners to get behind the scenes of BBC Breakfast, yes, the famous red couch, Radio 5 Live and BBC Sport. We got in front of the camera and behind the microphone to break the myths and see just what it's like to be out in the live media, which is what the project's about, 50-50 representation. 
And keeping on the BBC theme, we were really thrilled to be over at Chester Racecourse with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch having a Women in Tech event. And the brilliant, brilliant BBC Breakfast presenter, Louise Minchin, regaled the audience of talks of her story about Dare to Try and her journey from BBC Sofa to being a GB athlete, triathlete. Fantastic. So, so inspiring. And there's more. We managed to bring together our Liverpool Power Circle for a mini outing to the Liverpool Regional Business Awards and that was a really, really great fun. There was even a selfie competition which, do you know what, we didn't win and I am still waiting for the VAR uh, to come back because I really think we were robbed. Uh, we've been at the opening of the new hub, the 5G hub over uh, with Vodafone and we were also delighted to attend the first 100 event. Uh, women event over in the basement of uh, on the cellars of St George's Hall in Liverpool and then followed with a an in conversation with Dame Stella Remington the first director general of MI5 what an amazing legend and in July we've got the third of our Northern Powerman role model series with Nat West over in Newcastle talking about mentoring and we'll be closing out our first ever cohort of mentoring with Michael Page with our final event Please stay in touch with all of our updates at connect at northernpowerwomen.com or chat with us on social at North Power Women. Thanks and see you next month. Thank you as ever to the marvellous and tireless Simone. And again, really, really happy birthday to you. Twitter, as I'm sure you saw, was just awash with selfies. Great stuff. Now, each month we get together somewhere in the north to chat, to network and to discuss some of that month's hottest topics. Another big thank you to wonderful Durham University for hosting us in the beautiful business school. No, I believe that has broke decibel records, I think. And it was absolutely the, the loudest that we've ever had. What an amazing, amazing uh, environment here to study. It's at, to work and study, actually. It's absolutely phenomenal. Today, as I say, it's, it went to our second year of Northern Power Women podcast. And we're here to start the conversations. We've got three fantastic panellists that are going to join the discussion today. Professor Louise Bracken, who is the Executive Director for the Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience in the Department of Geography, Durham University. Now that, Louise, is a massive, massive business card, isn't it, right there? Louise is internationally renowned researcher, publishing in a range of top journals and managing a suite of research awards and a team of researchers and postgraduate students. And her personal research expertise is flooding in. That's appropriate today. It is in flooding and, and how knowledge of rivers is used in practice to manage the environment and help people. Moving on to John. John Waite is the owner and founder of Advertise One which focuses on independent businesses and sole traders, their current online advertising and digital marketing. Um, Advertise One um, was started, started doing projects for friends and family, um, registering as self-employed part-time in 2017, and it is now a full-time business as of last October 2008. Right. Welcome, John. And finally, our final is Dee Coxon, who is author, speaker, and coach, no pressure for me. <laughs> and Dee's purpose is to inspire midlife women to go beyond their known capabilities, answering their calling, and turn this into businesses. Welcome everyone to our panel. <laughs> it's early on a Thursday morning in Durham, but they're all they're all at it here today. Thank you so much. So, the first question that we've got today is. What can we do to give underrepresented women a voice, both regionally and globally? Uh, I know a search was done recently uh, whereby 23 out of 30 of the lowest paid jobs were done by women and 26 out of 30 of the highest paid were done by men. Professor Louise, I'm coming to you with the flooding. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about flooding. <laughs> um, I think we need to find ways to firstly encourage, secondly empower and thirdly listen to underrepresented women really. Um, and I think there's a range of mechanisms. There's apprenticeships, scholarships and there's lots of sort of cultural practices within organisations where we can be more participatory so we can have sort of equitable voices I suppose. 
In our research, we've done some work out in Nepal with women about understanding disaster risk reduction. So normally women in Nepal are not part of the governance structure, they're not listened to, they don't get to put in opinions. So we've worked with the National Society for Earthquake Technology um, in Nepal and we've worked with some women's groups, one in a rural location, one in urban, and we've actually gone and asked them what is worrying them most about the hazards and risks they face. And we've then given them small bits of money, so they've done projects, so the rural a group have then built a, a, a wall that's retaining a landslide. The urban group have then put in some hoses and some ponds to protect from fire because they live in very, the houses are very close together, they're all stacked on top of each other. So actually they've, they've learned, they've got capacity, they've, they've done new things, they've got solutions and they're inspiring each other but they're changing the way they work mm -hmm. and that's sort of taken our learning and our knowledge working with them to deliver something different and I think there's examples like that that are really important about how we can just change our practices and, and do things differently which are, I think we, we need more of that. It's part of that disruption isn't it and, and, and how we learn from them here. I mean that's amazing, that's phenomenal. John I am coming your way. Being on my own for six months the one thing that has been really good with myself is the startup community where it is a very mixed bag of both men and women and to back to the question of what can we do to give underrepresented women a voice both virtually globally is a case of you know what your talent is embrace your talent don't be scared to be different but you've got other people around you men and women and there's more and more in the style community of women want to do their own thing and being their own boss and just basically putting it out just putting it out there get yourself out there and just be proud of what you're doing and that's it's almost the same as looking either acting locally and what's happening globally it's that that power of community d what do you think how are we going to shift this well for me it's even more basic than that because i think uh, one of the very best places to start is at home uh, particularly with young women. I'll give you an example. For my upbringing, I had a wonderful upbringing, but a very strict upbringing. So while I had a voice at home, it was much later before I discovered that I was allowed to have a voice outside of that. Where I'm very lucky is I now have an eight-year-old granddaughter and I don't want her to be a worrier, I want her to be a warrior. And so the things that I didn't get to grips with when I was younger, I'm making sure that she identifies with that from really early on. For example, letting her realize and be aware of just how good she is because now and again we'll mention what she wants to do in the future and she said i think i'd like to work at the checkout at asda and while i wanted a bulk when she said that no disrespect i love asda uh, i asked her you know where did that come from what, what made you think about that and she said well grandma i love people imagine how many people you'll get to see in asda all day and so it was wonderful for me that that it is people that you connect with but then i had an opportunity to share with her other ways that you could connect with people she said I never really thought about that so I think it's so important that they know from an early age a how good they are and what's available to them so they can aspire to more than what you know their current limitations may be. And I think eight, eight is a key age as well isn't it because those gerio, gender stereotypes are formed so early uh, and I know we've got some some people in the audience today from the girls friendly society who are doing a lot of work around um, you know, young girls at this age, I'm coming your way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm Helen Morell. I work for Girls Friendly Society in the North East. I think one of the key things around giving girls and young women a voice is letting them know that they have a voice. We've just done some work recently around campaigning and our girls were sort of telling us, we know we're affected by these things, but actually we're concerned that if we did have a view about it, who would listen? And who would we tell? How can we, in a small market town in County Durham, make a change? Who will listen to us? How can we get a response? And how can we make that? Our, how can we make our point to somebody who's got influence, who can change things? So we are very much about disrupting and kind of encouraging them that they do have a voice and, and encourage them and linking with people who can help them be heard. And I think that's really important that if they've got an issue they want to talk about, that we can encourage them and support them to do that. It's well and truly disruptive Durham this morning, isn't it? But I think there's that, there is that common thread. So whether you're talking about Nepal, the startup community, your eight-year-old, it's, it's the simple things. I would also like to say, I think we do need to challenge cultures, though, that we can actually hear what people are saying. It's one thing to give them a platform, but we do actually need to prove that we're listening um, because, you, you, you know, we do want to empower people. We want people to say, we want people to contribute. But actually, there's something different about having the cultures in big businesses, organisations, government that actually will hear 
and demonstrate that they are actually listening as well. Brilliant, thank you. Right, the next question, oh, we've got a right meaty one now. So, with Brexit negotiations still on hiatus, uh, we had the news earlier this week that the North East would be the hardest hit by a no-deal Brexit. What are your hopes and concerns for this region moving forward? D. Um, well, for me, I have to be honest in that I've, I've watched the Brexit negotiations very closely these last three years, and like everyone else, have become pretty exhausted by it all and absolutely um, you know, really concerned by it. However, for me personally, it comes down to this, and, and I can only give a qualified answer from my point of view, uh, not from everyone else's point of view, but I think as a strong Northern woman myself, for me, the outcome is whatever the outcome is, because we don't know what that's going to be, but we will adapt and overcome. Brilliant. Louise, Brexit. Yes, I think we've got some challenges, whether we, well, what happen, whatever happens in, in Brexit. So really, regardless of Brexit, I suppose there's some things I'd really like to see. So one thing is that we do continue to attract and retain the best sort of staff, students, people um, in the North East. So we can, as Dee says, do the, do the challenging, kind of have that exchange. I think continued investment, um, and particularly in the North East, um, is really important, whether that's through research um, with the university or, in, or encouraging people to have impact and create good outcomes. Um, and also having the, the, the funding, but the skills and the processes to actually have that partnership working. I think for something in my career, that's been really important. So I think across the university, we have a lot of partnership grants and they might be from student placements through to much more strategic partnerships, say with IBM, P&G, Northumbrian Water, CPI. So we have quite a lot of those in Atom Bank. But we need, we need to keep that exchange of ideas. So we have, I've got a grant that's called the Water Hub, which is all about challenges with water, too much, too little. Um, but it's a partnership across then the university, Durham County Council, uh, Northumbrian Water and the Environment Agency. But we're sharing ideas, partly to grow small businesses and particularly tech transfer into the water sector, but also to actually come up with solutions so we can actually improve our water use. And that partnership and working across and that exchange of ideas across kind of business, policy, practice, research is actually phenomenal. And I think we want to carry on those type of links in the northeast so we can grow these things, grow the region, grow the north, but actually take them around the world. Um, so I think for me, I really want to focus on those things. Um, Brexit, whatever happens at Brexit. <laughs> so, so this is about the possibilities. What's the art of the possibility? It's always easy to look at what the barriers are. And this is a true, I think this is a real northern spirit though as well, isn't it? It's that, what's the potential? What's the potential of coming together to collaborate, to disrupt, to create mischief, but for that power for good? And there's a series of projects that we've got kind of in the region. Um, so we've got a northern accelerator that's trying to grow businesses. We've got Net Park, we've got a Durham City Incubator. So it's, it's we want to keep those going so we can keep kind of these changes and keep that challenging, I think. And we can put further information about these partnerships um, with the podcast uh, later on. Thank you. John. Hello. Right. So going back um, to what you both said, um, I started off my business on basically the decision of Brexit thinking, right, I need to leave my day job and go full time before Brexit happens so I can get hold of European funding. So this is where this question straight away makes me think. Since coming into the industry there is more local funding uh, there's accelerator schemes but the other thing is as well keep your mental health and don't worry about the future because every day is different uh, Brexit is a very small part of the industry you've got other factors that take place you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow what's going to happen next week all the case is adapt to the changes and be able to make the best of what you can because when one door closes, another one will open. Brilliant. So actually, John, what you're saying is you are powered by Brexit. I think, and again, this is about, um, you know, looking at things differently. It's looking at, you know, what we can do as opposed to constantly going, gosh, this is just going to be doom and gloom. I'm coming to Dr. Joanna. Hi, Dr Joanna Berry. I'm an Associate Professor in Entrepreneurship here at the Business School, of which I'm very proud, but I'm also a Regional Vice Chair for the Yorkshire and North East Institute of Directors. Both of those institutions are very keen to support something that you mentioned, John, which is mental health. And I think also coming back to something Louise said about partnerships and collaboration, one of the fabulous things that this podcast is doing and that you're doing, Simone, is giving that voice that we talked about a little bit earlier to people and in an environment where, as you're absolutely right, to 
to underline physically face to face with people people in this room are meeting people and communicating with people they might not ever otherwise meet and that um, partnership that ability to collaborate with people I think particularly in the space of supporting women is hugely important because it's very easy to feel a bit isolated for all the reasons that we've discussed already so I just I just wanted to highlight that comment. And it also goes back to um, Professor Louise's point is, is all, on all of the first questions, which is about that power of community, it's that power of coming together for that greater good. Any thoughts on, I mean, Brexit is a, something that can divide and conquer. It's not great for the restaurant conversations at times, isn't it? You know, I feel like there almost wants to be an arm wrestle. But any, any views from the audience? I am coming up the steps. Hello, my name is Vasanti Piet and uh, I work in the School of Modern Languages. Um, I'm not British, I'm a French citizen, but I've been living here for uh, 25 odd years. Um, I've heard the word adapt um, from you, uh, John, and also mental health. And, uh, and uh, so far you've been you know, discussing the um, entrepreneurial and the business uh, um, situation with Brexit. On a personal level uh, and as a linguist, what I have found in this part of the UK is uh, a growing intolerance for multilingualism and um, more anxiety as a foreign speaker, more anxiety about speaking in my mother tongue, which is French, uh, whether it's on the bus or in Sainsbury's. Um, I haven't personally been affected by any aggressive comments um, or disrespectful attitude, but many of my colleagues have. And um, um, you, you said, uh, Simone, that uh, the Northeast um, uh, was going to be the hardest hit by, by Brexit, and it's also uh, potentially the area that voted the most yeah. uh, for uh, um, for Brexit um, and, and that that culture is palpable and uh, it's quite detrimental as well to diversity. So yes, the, the majority of the North East voted to leave uh, back in the referendum. Any, any other comments around Brexit? Can you believe we are on to our final question of today's panel? Last month, um, a Times journalist saw his tweet go viral when he called two weeks paternity leave bewildering can you believe it uh, he went on to say mothers and fathers are being robbed of time with their families everyone seemed to agree with him but why is this not shifting we're a few years on now from um, paternity leave but why is it not shifting and what can we do um, and John I'm gonna come to you first I think it's uh, going back to uh, discussions that we've uh, just had earlier on about uh, Brexit that's overtaken the news that's over that's basically um, all the decisions in Parliament at the minute, uh, this is not getting looked at. So when Brexit has uh, has completed, this could be then something which will be looked at next. Uh, it's just basically, I think it's just on the back burner. It's not being ignored. It's just the priority is at the minute trying to sort out what's happening with this country and the EU. Um, I fully agree with what he's saying. Um, man, man or woman, uh, the uh, paternity leave should be the same amount of time and also for a longer amount of time as well even if it's a case where it's working from home or working um on flexible hours at, at least i think it's i think that should be even the new way of working but definitely on paternity leave because it's still only two to three percent of men that actually take the leave and they only get statutory pay and obviously because men generally earn more than women it's almost like that double whammy and also I know there's I know anecdotally as well as what we read in the press there's actually evidence of taunting bullying for taking that time up yeah, man up what are you doing that for well it's your child uh, D. well I've done a little bit of research around this and clearly we can learn a lot from um, Sweden particularly Stockholm who has been identified from a study from the HSBC as the happiest place in Europe to, to live and work. Not surprisingly, because uh, they don't have maternity or paternity leave, they have parental leave. Mm -hmm. And the couple have 480 days between them to share, to go off and look after the babies. Um, they get 80% of salary paid while they do that. Uh, 90 of those days are encouraged. They're called um, affectionately daddy days because the companies 
um, support the dads to at least take those 90 days off to be with the children. But moving on from that, um, the, they aren't incentivised to come back to work, they're incentivised to take that time off mm. uh, so the dads can have more time with the children, you know, be better uh, mm. families, inclusive families and enjoy that time. But they take it on from that, that when they come back to work, again in Stockholm, um, the flexible working hours are incredible so they, they let the partners work together so that they only work 10 till 4 or 9 till 3 and then they go off and collect the children and what the, the staff have said is that even though they work shorter hours they're so much more efficient because they're you know they're working at peak at those times they haven't got the stress and the worry about childcare on top of going to work and you know they say it isn't easy they've still got busy lives they've still got to pick up the children from daycare but they are so much more productive and efficient and many of these people have worked in the UK and the US and said uh, by comparison we are relatively lazy because even though we work much longer hours we're not productive during their hours, so I think we could learn a lot from Sweden. Actually, last time I was in the northeast, uh, up the way at, at Teesside, one of our panelists also sat on a, a Swedish Chamber of Commerce, and she introduced me to someone who has a, um, a head office in the north, uh, and it's a, a big um, DIY kind of organisation, and she was the CFO, and I went in to see her, and exactly to your point, Swedish, Swedish values, and, and and I think it was it was a it was a guy who was just starting to foster, and he was saying, oh, you know, what, I'm not going to take that paternity because it's it's okay, you know, we got this, and she, um, how would I say it, enthusiastically encouraged to say, you know, you, you, your job is here, you know, by you going, what we also do is we encourage somebody to come into your position, and get that six months or whatever it may be of of learning stepping up it's all very open and transparent so that they get that opportunity so you're not only having time with your family you're also giving somebody else another chance as well so it's almost it's that double positive if you like of things like that so should we be more sweden who knows uh, professor louise um, I think we need to challenge some of our cultures and our practices, really. So I, I'd like to see a change where we give people the confidence to make choices that are right for their family context um, and you know, empower people to say what that is and ask. Because at the moment, I think we have certain models for how it should work, but everybody's, your challenges are different in terms of you know, your family setup, what jobs you've got maybe between you, or even if there's only one of you. Um, and we need to learn to respect those decisions, I think, and that they can be across so that there's no one way, there's plenty of ways of doing it. And I think if we could get that change, then you can make the decisions that are right for you and then hopefully roll that out through work. I mean, I've been quite lucky, I think, at the university. I've had two children <laughs> um, and I've actually had significant caring um, responsibilities at parts of my career, but I've been able to go part-time for some time. I've then worked flexibly, I suppose, and I've taken on different roles. So I still have had brilliant career progression, I think, really. And But I've been able to do that change and evolve and, like you just said, grow different skills. Um, so I do feel quite supported and that has made it possible. I equally have a very supportive husband um, who has you know, really stepped up and, and we do manage the family across both of us. So, and, I, and I think there's something really about flexibility um, that you can, you've, you've got to do your job, but you can choose how, when, where, and, and you get the job done. So that enables you to work as a team across your family, I suppose, whatever the demands and whatever the challenges. And for that to be embraced, I think, across business and organisations more fully would hopefully enable people to, um, you know, make different choices, good for their kids, good for their well-being, you know, good for work. And it is about, the, we've talked about culture again, it's about the culture of those organisations and not doing it in a tick box way. There is no one size fits all solution to this. And I think it was when many years ago when Apple were building their sparkly new headquarters and they put everything in it you know we'll have had bean bags in because you can't be you know cool office without having bean bags and it had you know the pods and the sleep pods and very much around well-being and mental health uh, but in this organization that employed so many out in Silicon Valley there was absolutely no capacity or anything set up around childcare and it was like I think it was something like 250 architects and project managers had worked on this global brand and it was like that dome moment where they thought oh actually there is something something missing um from this so but absolutely it has to has to be within that culture hello hello i'm jordan christie from the northern accelerator project um i think building on what louise was saying about culture we need to remember that 
the rights that women have and the acceptance about women's maternity leave didn't happen overnight so the law didn't change and all of a sudden it was acceptable for women to take their full maternity leave and I think men now need to go through some of the pain that women have gone through in order so the law is there to support them now to take that shared parental leave um, yes that needs to adapt more they need to have equal pay in, during that time um, but they now need to go through that creating the cultural acceptance of that and absolutely women and men need to do that together but that didn't happen for women overnight and it's not going to happen for men overnight. And do you think it is about that visibility of, of, of men taking that do we need but at the moment we haven't we're not seeing masses of men going I, I've done it I've taken it. I think as well we've got to remember the current generation of parents their dads didn't take paternity leave and they're in most families they're their mothers were, were the predominant parent. So it perhaps is going to take a couple of generations of men starting to take more of that time off. And then when it comes to them having children, or their children having children, that'll be more of a, a normal accepted thing to do. So I think sadly, it, it's not gonna be an overnight change. But it is about starting this for, the, for our next generation, for the future. I'm running back round, look at me running. I'm really getting my steps in today, Durham. <laughs> I think it's it's a, a fascinating concept, but I don't. I think we don't do ourselves any favours with the sort of presenteeism that some of our esteemed sisters show when they almost they almost boast about the fact that they only had five weeks off, or they only had two weeks off, or they take their children to work and put them under the desk. I mean, you know, that, which is. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, I suppose, but but I do think that that we could be a little more gentle on ourselves. Uh, and I hate to generalise, but to make the point that there are, there are some of the role models that are absolutely inspirational in some ways, but who've made a point of saying that they could only do this because either they're hugely well funded and they can afford someone else to look after their kids, or they were super women and they went back to work looking fabulous and feeling fabulous after like three days, which just doesn't happen in the real world. Uh, I'm Rachel Archibald, I'm the Head of Equality and Inclusion at Durham University. I think what we've found here is there are cultures within organisations and some people might be pioneering because their job role enables them to actually take that time out. But some people who are very technical, who have to be in a manufacturing area, it's not as always easy for them to take time out. They have to be at the workplace. So it's where that flexibility enables and allows. So what we're trying to do is collect those narratives of those men that have come forward, who have taken that time out. And we give those examples where their wife has had the first three months off and then they've gone in and they've shared that rest of that paternity leave. And I think if they can share their stories, if they can tell you how that's worked for them, they tell you the challenges they face, um, even down to how they've worked out the finances, because it, it isn't a simple process. It's a tricky complex. And until that's actually worked through, people don't understand it in an accessible way. So we need to share those stories about how they've done it, how they've achieved it. They become role models. And when people hear that story, when they hear, well, actually, I can do that, I think they then take, they pay attention and think, actually, I can, that's me. Next time, that's me. And I think it's about how we do that. So how we, how we take that learning from our experiences, from women's experiences, and how we've navigated motherhood and working and parenting, and how we bring that and, and engage with men to say, actually, we can do it together. Absolutely, it's about that. It is about that story, storytelling, and actually learning that it's not mission easy, you know. And and I think sometimes that sharing of the challenges of it will help other people navigate that landscape as well. So, Professor Louise, I don't think we've quite got the language to talk about it yet either. So I think what Rachel said is really important. Um, I actually have a stay-at-home husband now who is taking the lead on looking after the kids. And it's fascinating, even on the, the forms you have to fill in, be it insurance or anything, you've got to tick a box for occupation. So what's been really interesting is what my husband wants to call himself and the lack of possibilities. You know, so for years we'd have said housewife or stay-at-home mum. Uh, you know, we need to work out whether they're acceptable for, you know, people behaving differently now and actually have a greater variety so you can describe yourself in a comfortable way and, and not maybe be labelled or pigeonholed. And, and seeing him go through it is actually really interesting because it, it raises issues that, you know, we've, we've set them up over decades, hundreds of years for women. They're, they're actually not there in the same way for these changes, I think, to then roll out. What did he call himself? 
I can't remember. <laughs> but there is a whole lexicon. Language is a whole other, a whole other thing that we've talked about on on this podcast before about those. You know, sometimes that there can be the barrier. And again, if you want to join in this conversation at North Power Women, brilliant. Thank you. I'm coming. Hello. Hi, Lucy Carlin. I think there's still a kind of economic reality to get our heads around as well. Um, and that a lot of women, when they have children, are simply priced out of the workplace because of the cost of childcare. And I think that's something that needs to inform that discussion and hopefully that will change. And I think that's one of the things that will mitigate against the over-reliance on the man's economic role in the family and I think I think that needs to shift and then hopefully we'll, we'll get more parity in the families and this is down to the fact that often men are earning more than women so it's hard you know they don't want to take that hit and then have to pay for childcare, etc etc I'm coming go I'm going from side to side of the room over here <laughs> Hi, my name is Joanna Waite. I'm the project manager for the Tech Up project here at Durham. I think what it's also important to um, think about is that taking that time off is not necessarily a downside to your career. You you learn a lot of skills while you're at home raising children and um, managing the household. I've just gone through the process of evaluating 159 applications for our programme and I've seen some wonderful CVs where women have described the skills that they have learned as part of managing their household, managing timetables, managing budgets. It's all incredibly important skills that are still useful in your working career. So it, while we look at that break from work as being negative, it's, it, it's, a, it's a whole mindset change that it's not a negative, it's not time out, it's just different skills and a different type of work. I'm sure I've seen some figures somewhere about if you consider the um, work you do at home as a stay-at-home parent as a job, it's actually the equivalent of working two full-time jobs. So I think um, you need... It's, it's a real mindset change that it is not a negative to be at home. You are still developing yourself just in different ways. Thank you so much. This has been a really lively discussion today in Durham and I want to thank all of our panellists today and I want to thank all of you in the audience for being loud, noisy, disruptive community which has been thread through today. So thank you all Durham. Thank you all for taking part. Thank you again to our panel. You were terrific. And of course, to Simone. And thank you if you came along to take part. Thanks again also to Durham University for being such brilliant hosts. Now, we'd love to see you. So do keep your eye on Twitter at North Power Women for details of our next recording. And of course, if you'd like to host us, well, we'd love to come and see you. So do get in touch. You can email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. The big interview this month comes from one of the most inspiring yet humble women I've ever had the pleasure to chat to. Professor Sue Black, OBE, is an award-winning computer scientist, technology evangelist and digital skills expert. She's Professor of Computer Science at Durham University and she also has one heck of a story. I started by asking her what it was about tech that just excites her so much. Well, it just technology gets me so excited, I guess. You know, from my background, technology and education completely changed my life and my life chances. I just see how technology enables people to do so many things that you can't do without it. So, you know, I, I think of technology not as kind of one thing really, but as a like a suite of tools that you can use to improve your life in, in all sorts of different ways. So, you know, like communication, is a key one. I love social media. I love catching up with people on Twitter. Uh, I ran the campaign to save Bletchley Park using social media. So technology, they're connecting people in a way that we just could never, ever connect with each other before. Yeah. Stuff like, you know, the Me Too campaign and Black Lives Matter. It's amazing to me how through one word with a hash symbol on the front, so through one hashtag, millions of people around the world that care about the same things can connect with each other and, and make social change happen. So, I mean, I just, I could go on and on. That's, that's just one of the things. Um, I think technology is empowering our lives in so many different ways. And uh, yeah, I, I find it hard to stop talking about it. <laughs> well, so where did this passion come from? I mean, you, you, you so clearly love it and it is, yeah. as you said, changed your life, but where did it yeah. come from? 
Well, I guess when I was a kid, um, so that's like back in the 60s and 70s now, um, I guess I didn't really know much about technology or computers then really, but I, I loved maths at school. I left school at 16 and ended up going back into education when I was 26 after I'd ended up, unfortunately, in a refuge for six months. Uh, I was bringing my three older kids up on my own and I was trying to work out what was I going to do with the rest of my life. I'd been out of education for 10 years. I decided to go back into education. I did a maths course at college and then we did some computing as part of that and then that led me to going to uni, to Southbank Uni in London to study computer science and then really, you know, just finding out more and more about technology and, and just seeing, I don't know, I just got so excited by it, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of carried on. I did a PhD in software engineering and then became an academic and, you know, I've done all sorts of things since then with technology. Mm. And, yeah, I mean, I just love it. I do want to go back several stages in your story because your story is yeah. just completely extraordinary and I know you've told it a lot of times but I have to say yeah. every time I hear it I get goosebumps just oh. hearing about your courage and your bravery and your determination to succeed can you yeah. just go back because as you said you'd left school at 16 you were a really young woman just yeah. you know in your early 20s three very small children you're in an abusive marriage and you you literally ran away you ran out of yeah. the house with your children yeah yeah well so we were living on a, it wasn't a house actually we were on the 30th floor of a tower block in um, Labrick Grove in London and uh yeah unfortunately my ex-husband like I think it was about six o'clock in the morning threatened us all or uh, well, threatened he was going to kill us all there'd been some signs of it before but but nothing that dramatic really and and I just thought I'd kind of been thinking a few weeks before that when things weren't going so well that mm. I needed to look for an opportunity to escape. So I suppose I just kind of, that happens and I thought, okay, this is our opportunity to go. So yeah, my older daughter then was um, three and I had twin boys that were one. And I just thought, okay, th this is this is the time when we're just going to go. So packed a suitcase, maybe with nappies and um, got got the boys in the double buggy, got my um, three-year-old daughter kind of alongside me, got the suitcase in one hand and kind of like pushing the buggy with the other hand and uh, went over to a friend's house over the road and uh, called Women's Aid. And then later that afternoon, we, you know, we ended up in a Women's Aid uh, place in uh, Peckham, the other side of London. Mm -hmm. And that night we were in a refuge and, and safe and uh, stayed there six months, then left there, got a council flat in Brixton, South London, got Emma into school, because she was four by then, and got the boys into playgroup for two hours a day, and then thought to myself, well, so, so what am I going to do now? Um, I'd not really expected to end up in that situation. I didn't really have a proper plan, apart from kind of getting the kids sorted. And yeah. I thought, well, I'll try and go back to work now. But actually, I realised that there's no way I could really go back to work because I couldn't earn enough money to even pay for childcare. I'd left school with five O levels and I probably would have been on minimum wage going back into the workplace. And with three small children, you know, there's just no way that however many hours I worked, I wouldn't be able to pay for childcare for the three of them. So that wasn't really an option. And, th and then thought about going back into education. I'd left school at 16. I hadn't really wanted to, to leave school at the time, but I just had to because of my circumstances. So I thought, okay, well, Maybe this is a good opportunity for me to go back into education. And hopefully if I can get a degree, then I'll be able to earn more money. That, yeah. that was basically it, get a job and earn more money to support my family. So what was it about maths? What made you go, maths is, is my future? <laughs> I, I always loved it. I don't exactly know why. You know, like when I was a kid, my I used to spend my pocket money. We used to um, go to the local shopping centre maybe about once a month or something. And I would run straight into WH Smith and straight over to the maths textbook section so I could buy myself a maths textbook with my pocket <laughs> money. So I don't know why I was like that, but I just was. I just loved maths. I loved doing like problems. I loved things like riddles and mazes and all of that kind of stuff. I liked all of it. So I, I guess it's kind of linked to that. So you, you do maths, you get top of your class, you do a degree, you're then invited with a scholarship 
to do yeah. a PhD, which if you look yeah. back even, you know, the, the few years previously was a million miles from where you'd been. But it took you seven years to get your PhD. I'm guessing mainly because yeah. of the, all the other huge responsibilities you had <laughs> going on yeah. in your life. W- was yeah. there a time, though, Sue, that you ever thought, oh, this is, this is too much? Did you ever think about giving up? Yeah, loads of time. <laughs> <laughs> so what, where did the resilience yeah. come from? What made you keep going? Well, I think in a way, I didn't know what else to do, to be honest. I mean, you know, I just thought, if I can't do this, what am I going to do? You know, like, I just didn't know what else to do. So I think, you know, like, time and again, I, I you know, like, when I was doing my degree, I can remember going into my personal tutor and, and crying and saying, I just can't, I can't do all of it. You know, like the kids and the... Mm. The fact that I can't be at uni the whole time and I can't get all the coursework done and, you know, I haven't got enough money and blah, 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 and then sit there crying and, and somehow he'd persuade me to to carry on, you know. And at the end of the first year, I think we had to get 50% in our, um, to pass the first year of the degree and I got something like 52, you know. So I just kind of scraped through and then just kind of like gradually things got easier and easier. Um, you know, when I was doing my PhD, to make more money I did part-time teaching which scared me half to death honestly I just (laughs) I remember you know like being offered teaching and thinking well I've got to do it because it's more money and I need more money Um, but I really didn't want to you know I was really shy as a kid and still as an adult I was really shy back then and the thought of standing in front of people teaching a class was uh, enough to make me sort of like almost have a heart attack and die so um, I was so frightened so yeah so the night before, I, m- I remember my first uh, class that I taught the night before, I didn't sleep at all. And I, you know, and kind of like on the way there, I was like, you know, it's like having a death sentence is what it felt like to me. I just thought I was going to die in some way. Um, but then actually the class went fine. It was okay. And like gradually over the years, I just kind of got a bit more and a bit more confident, I suppose. And I don't know. I just feel, you know, maybe because I had lots of challenges earlier on in my life, it, it kind of gave me an inner confidence that I could actually overcome them I you know Mm. I don't really know but um somehow I managed to keep going and battle through it all and you know I think that's actually something you know I wish I'd kind of been taught that kind of thing at school that if you just keep going you will get there because I don't really remember anyone ever really saying anything about kind of resilience and keeping going and you know it was all about getting the best grades and I you know I wasn't I was a good student at primary school, but at, at secondary school, I was pretty much a C minus student. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't getting the top grades and it, it never really occurred to me that I could be that successful. Yeah. So so you were incredibly successful with your PhD. <laughs> then you'd almost think the challenge is over. But then, Sue, you went into tech as a yeah. woman. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it was such a such a male world when you when you first graduated and went into tech. I mean, as, as a single yeah. mum of three yeah. still fairly young children did yeah. did you feel did you ever have feel you had trouble being taken seriously by the, the men of the tech world well kind of not really i mean i was still in academia so it, it really it wasn't too bad i don't remember that so much i remember you know like at work so you know like when i was working as a lecturer i don't remember that apart from going to conferences and then sometimes like basically men getting the wrong idea when I was trying to chat to them at conferences about my research and stuff and so it was actually the the first conference I went to um I was still ridiculously shy and my PhD supervisor had told me to network at conferences you know like you've got to go and talk to people because it's not only what you know it's who you know yeah so you know I kind of had my instructions I've got to talk to people so I chatted to this guy who gave a a really good uh, presentation chatted to him in the break and then for the rest of the conference every time I turned around he was staring at me and I got really freaked out like thinking what did I do wrong you know what did I say wrong and um you know I don't think he did anything wrong uh, and I don't think I did anything wrong either but it was just my complete kind of lack of uh, emotional intelligence I guess and and also me not realizing that that my environment was probably about 90% men and 10% women. And I I really don't think I thought about that at all. That was just normal for me because it was the same as my degree and Mm. and possibly the same as the other lecturers uh, at the uni. So I hadn't thought about that. And it wasn't really until I went to a women in science conference in Brussels sometime after that. And and so for the first time really was in an all-female environment and just had such an amazing time you know, like I, I didn't need to try and approach people to go and talk to them because every, it seemed to me like everyone was talking to everyone already. You know, it's like yeah. it just was a whole different environment and it really 
help me to realize that if you're in the majority life is just easier and and you know there's just lots of things going on which you know when you're in a, a minority that you just don't realize and um it just kind of changed my life really i came back from there thinking i've got to set up a a network for women in tech in the uk so that even if we don't meet each other in person we can meet each other online and chat to each other so i came back that was in 1998 and set up bcs women which is the british computer society women's group which was then the you know the first sort of women in tech group in the uk yeah. and you know and kind of as as uh, when i was setting that up i got some comments from some guys like oh why can't you set up a group for men in tech <laughs> like, the whole of tech is a group for men in tech you know like <laughs> you know some funny stuff and, and one of my colleagues at work said why are you ghettoizing yourself and I was like is that what you think I'm doing I'm creating a ghetto I feel like I'm setting up this lovely network for women to chat to each other about technology which we love and you think it's a ghetto um so yeah I've got some choice comments <laughs> but you but you were resilient and continued regardless yeah, well, like I knew I was doing something good, I suppose, yeah. and and also I had support from from other uh, people around me, you know, women, but not only women, and um, you know, the British Computer Society supported me to set it up, and you know, so I've had lots of support from uh, women and and from men, but yeah. Why do you think, Sue, historically and still to a degree, you know, it's true today that that tech is such a male dominated world? Why, when we think of people working in tech, do we think of men in baseball caps and Converse boots hacking away at code. And I say that because my husband's one of those men, actually. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but why, yeah. why do we think of a man? So it is about 80% now. And it was, you know, back in 1998 when I was doing all that stuff, it was 80% uh, then roughly. So that actually the figures haven't changed. Mm. I think going back before that, I mean, going back to the 60s and the 50s, I think, I think programmers were mainly women. Um, as yeah. far as I can tell, what's kind of happened is that when kind of big business realized that there was money to be made from software and from technology then kind of big business moved in and turned it into a different kind of profession really and one in which it was you know lots of men in suits which kind of these days has turned into men in converse <laughs> uh, I guess <laughs> and and the media has kind of you know portrayed that as well so it's it's a combination of factors I think and you're completely right, because I'm thinking about Bletchley Park. I mean, as you mentioned already, you ran yeah. that phenomenal campaign, which again took you years, but you didn't give up uh, to save <laughs> to save Bletchley Park. And that was yeah. staffed, staffed mainly by women. Yeah, 8,000 women and about 2,000 men. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, it was the Second World War. Most of the guys were away fighting. So, you know, it makes sense that... Um, that it was mainly women that worked there. But like, you know, I was amazed the first time I went there to find out that 10,000 people had worked there and then mm. to find out that 8,000 of them were women and I'd never heard about it and I couldn't find anything online. Um, so that's why in, I think it was 2003, I decided to try and do something to record the memories of the women that worked there, which we did. And then at the launch of that project, found out that Bletchley Park might have to close because they were having financial difficulties uh, and so then started a campaign to save it in 2008. And you were, you were of course, successful and, and a really great book as well. You wrote about that, which is still available, of course. Um, Saving Bletchley Park, yes. <laughs> tell me about Tech Mums, because that's your latest, yeah. um, one of your latest social... One of my latest yeah. things, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, seven or eight years ago, I suppose after the Bletchley Park campaign, I think I must have a campaigning personality. Or, you know, like I want to change the world to... To, to be more like I want it to be and um, so the Bletchley Park campaign was over and I was kind of like well, what am I going to do now um, and I thought that I you know I love technology I really want everyone to understand the benefits of technology for everybody um, but kind of like you know the stuff in the media is all about you know robots that are killing people or whatever and you know computers, <laughs> take, computers taking away everyone's jobs and that sort of thing it's always negative 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 and I just thought but I see technology as, as an amazing way to create jobs, to create opportunities. Why is that never portrayed in the media? Mm. And um, so I thought I really want to do something about it. And I don't know if you know the Little Britain sketch, Computer Says No. Oh, but I just thought, yes. What I want to do is, is try and change it to people's thought process. Computer Says Yes, you know, like it's all these opportunities. So 
I um, started running workshops for seven-year-old kids doing stuff like app design and coding. So before that was in schools and had great success really straight away. And one of the things we did was get the parents in at the end of the day to have a go at what the kids had been doing. And when I asked the parents to have a go at, um, at that time, we had like Raspberry Pis kind of set up and the kids were writing <laughs> Python code. So when I asked the parents to have a go, I noticed that um, in general, the dads would just be like, would just step in and kind of like, yeah, what do you want me to do? And some of the mums had a bit of a look of horror on their faces. And that just kind of started the thought process in my head. I just thought, actually, why don't I teach tech skills to mums? Because we need more women in tech. I want women and particularly mums to see what opportunities there are out there in technology. And also, if we can get mums on board with um, tech and kind of like more positive uh, with technology, then of course we get kids on board as well. So to, you know, try and I guess tick several boxes for me at the same time. And also there was this saying, which I kept hearing at the time, it's so easy, your mum can do it. And I just like, that just drives me insane <laughs> hearing things like that. It's like, how dare you say that sort of thing about mums? So I just kind of wanted mums to be the smart tech role models in the family as well, I guess. So I put together a program and called it Tech Mums with stuff like uh, web design and app design, social media, coding. Got it accredited by eSkills and then started running it at a school in um, Tower Hamlets in the East End and had great success straight away, really, with the mums coming along. You know, we could really see how... It was building their not only their tech skills but their confidence as well. Yeah. You know, we had some great successes straight away really. And that's I think seven years ago now. And we're sort of, you know, going going from strength to strength. We're running in various places around the country at the moment. We also ran Tech Mums T V. So in partnership with um Home Start UK, we got funding from Nominet Trust and with Homestart UK and Facebook, we ran like a mums in tech kind of chat show. We live streamed it from Facebook HQ last year and had, I think, 300,000 views really quickly. And apparently we got a higher percentage engagement than David Beckham. <laughs> what? You beat yeah, David Beckham? Great. Wow. Yeah, we beat David Beckham. Yeah. So so that was really cool because lots of mums were chatting to us like while we were doing stuff. Um and so we got a very high percentage engagement, which was great. And we're we're currently looking for a studio and team to to help us do Tech Mums TV season two. But yeah, we so we won the Beamer Award for inclusion and diversity for Tech Mums TV last year. Um, but we, yeah, we'd like to run that again because it was so successful in reaching so many mums. We're talking to you, Sue, about the phenomenal things you've achieved in your life. Quite often, when the odds were stacked against you, actually. People might think, well, yeah, she's got that resilience. She's, she pushes forward and things click into place. But, it, it, you know, life's never that simple. And, and quite often things didn't work out for you first time around. How did you cope when things didn't go to plan? Um, well, I think like anybody, you just feel fed up to start with. <laughs> um, and, you know, that might last quite a long time. But I think when, when things don't quite work out, so like you're fed up because they haven't worked out, uh, maybe a bit depressed sometimes, depending on what's happening. But then somehow, I I don't know, I just, uh, at some point, I kind of get over that and just think, okay, well, I've got to make it happen and just kind of get back on it again. I don't quite know exactly where it comes from. And what's your message to someone who is in that place right now, who is perhaps not exactly where you were at, at 23 and the challenges you faced then, but at a time in yeah. your career or their life and they're thinking, I want to be there right now. I can't see how I can get there. What what message can you give them? I think, I think try and find other people that either are in a similar situation and want to achieve similar goals to you that you can make friends with and support each other um, and or find people that will help you kind of get get to where you want to go because there's there's loads of people have helped me and they they couldn't have helped me if I hadn't asked them for help and I think you know you, if you ask for help you people don't always say yes but I think again you've got to just keep trying uh keep asking people and eventually you'll find the right people to help you but, you know you've got you've got to find your allies and find your kind of support network and support other uh, people that are trying to to do that too and don't get disheartened if it doesn't all work out straight away just kind of like have a bit of a rest and then get back on it again
an enormous thank you to Professor Sue Black for her time this month. She's running so many brilliant initiatives at Durham University, including Tech Up. It's a fantastic programme offering 100 women across the North and the Midlands the chance to retrain in the digital sector thanks to a new online programme. Now, the programme is open to women with degrees in any subject, so do get online and search for Tech Up Durham for more details. Whose life and career would you like to know more about? Do let us know, please. Email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Now, normally at this time, we would delve into Ask the Hive, and fear not, it will be back next month. But we also wanted to take some time to showcase some brilliant women. Perhaps women you might not have heard of. Perhaps you've not read any articles by them or heard them speak at any conferences. But women who are making the world a better place and who are really, really appreciated by people around them as well. It's time for some Northern Power Women shout outs. I'd like to give a shout out to Kate Vogelsang of Birdsong Consultancy. She's so fantastic at giving advice on social media. The best thing I've read for ages is her article on how to do social media every day in 15 minutes. Have a read, it's on her LinkedIn profile. Kate Vogelsang, fantastic advice on social media. I'd like to give a shout out to Olivia Clayton, who is the Pensions and Reward Director at Manchester Airport. Olivia works so hard every day for the airport, giving her all, and for me, she is truly one of the unsung heroes. My shout out is for the wonderful Avita Patel. Ever since we met her, she's been incredible support. She's incredibly talented and extremely kind, and she always freely gives her time and expertise to help in any way she can. So thanks so much, Avita. I'd like to give a shout out to a colleague and she's also a friend called Jackie Floyd. So Jackie has been an inspiration to me over the last year and I know she inspires so many other people with all the fantastic work that she does as a counsellor and also a volunteer and she gets involved in so many different projects. I'm just in awe of her ability to get involved and her passion really as well. So Jackie's been involved in lots of different projects, volunteering with Keep Black Bin Tidy. She's a trustee on the food bank. She's a labour counsellor and she's fantastic at being a champion for a whole range of causes. So the list goes on, but she just inspires so many people with her enthusiasm, her commitment and her drive for positive change. So yeah, I just wanted to give her a shout out because I think she's awesome. My MPW shout out is for Karen Beddo of Mini Travellers who is celebrating five years of blogging today and who's turned it into an award winning business. My shout out is to Trish Keating. She's amazing, so selfless and she always supports everyone no matter what. She's just brilliant. Thank you so much if you took the time to send us your shout out. It is just brilliant to be able to let people know how appreciated they are. Now, if there's a woman or a man who you think deserves some special recognition, please just let us know. Just record a voice memo on your phone and you can email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. We will make sure it appears on a future episode. So please do that now. Next month, Ask the Hive is back. And here is the question our listener needs some advice on. I'm trying to get a new job at a fairly junior level and nine times out of ten don't even get a confirmation they have received my application. What can I do to stand out from the crowd? How frustrating. We've all been there, haven't we, at some time or another. So what did you do? Please do get in touch, offer your advice, record a voice memo on your phone and email it to podcast at northernpowerwomen.com or, of course, come to our next live panel recording and you can tell us there. All the details will be posted on Twitter at North Power Women or on Instagram at Northern Power Women. Well, there we go for yet another month of great stories, great advice and great ideas. A massive thank you again to the incredible Durham University for being such brilliant hosts. A globally outstanding centre of teaching and research excellence. A collegiate community of extraordinary people. A unique and historic setting. Durham is a university like no other. 
And a big thank you to you as well for listening, uh, for sharing the podcast, of course, amongst everyone you know. The more people who hear it, the mightier we can be together. So we'd so appreciate just a little minute of your time to leave us a review or a comment wherever you're listening to this podcast. Save the date. The next episode arrives on Monday, the 5th of August. Until then, this is the Northern Power Women podcast. I'm Sam Walker, and this has been a What Goes On Media production for Northern Power Women.